Imagine that a family, once united by love and prosperity, is torn apart by greed, betrayal, and dark secrets. A powerful business mogul dies suddenly, leaving behind a legacy that plunges his family into a bitter feud. The first wife, desperate to secure her share, resorts to sinister means, while the second wife fights to protect her children. But when a mysterious death shakes the family, the lines between justice and revenge blur, leading to a chilling confrontation that will leave you on the edge of your seat. In this episode of Anansi Web of Tales, we unravel a story filled with suspense, emotion, and unexpected twists. As the battle for wealth spirals out of control, who will emerge victorious and at what cost? Join us as we dive into a tale where the love of money leads to a fight for survival. Mr. Ohameng, a well-established business mogul, sat comfortably in his plush office, surrounded by the symbols of his success, where he reviewed the day's work. Just as he was about to leave for the day, his lawyer, Mr. Aduboahen, knocked gently on the door. Come in, Mr. Ohameng called out, not expecting anything unusual. Mr. Aduboahen entered, his face serious. Mr. Ohemeng, we need to talk about something important, he began, taking a seat across from the businessman. I strongly recommend that you consider making a will. The suggestion caught Mr. Ohemeng off guard. He frowned, his thoughts immediately racing. A will? Adubuahen, I'm not even that old yet. Isn't it too early for that? Mr. Adubuahen leaned forward, his expression earnest. I understand, but it's crucial to have your affairs in order to protect your family. You've worked hard for everything you have, and we wouldn't want any disputes after you're gone. Mr. Ohameng shook his head, a hint of unease in his voice. I've heard stories, you know. Men who write their wills too early. It's like tempting fate. They don't live long afterward. I'd rather wait until I'm older. The lawyer sighed, knowing he had done his duty, but unable to shake his own concerns. Think about it, Mr. Ohameng. You have seven children, four from your first wife and three from your second wife. You've taken care of them all, but things could change after you're gone. People you least expect could cause trouble. Mr. Ohemeng glanced out the window, his thoughts clouded by doubt. I love my children, he murmured, but I never imagined there could be problems. I trust my family. Unbeknownst to him, his first wife, Mrs. Chewa, harbored deep resentment, a resentment that simmered quietly, waiting for the right moment to erupt. And as Mr. Ohemeng dismissed the idea of making a will, the seeds of future conflict were already taking root. Mr. Ohemeng was the epitome of success. He had built not just one, but two houses for his wives, each a testament to his wealth and commitment to providing for his family. His own residence, grand and separate, stood as a symbol of his achievements. Beyond these homes, he owned two flourishing companies in Ghana, further cementing his status as a formidable businessman. His second wife, an educated and astute woman named Mrs. Ababresa, managed one of his companies with the same diligence that Mr. Ohemeng himself applied to his endeavors. Some of his children, from both marriages, held high positions within his businesses, making the family enterprise seem like a well-oiled machine from the outside. But beneath this surface of prosperity, trouble was brewing. Since the day Mr. Ohemeng married his second wife, Mrs. Chewa's heart had been consumed by bitterness. This resentment seeped into her words, which she used to turn their children, Abaye, Kumiwa, Jamfi, and Awuku, against their father. In his mind, Mr. Ohemeng believed he had done everything right, 
providing for his family, ensuring their future was secure. But he was blind to the storm that was silently gathering, a storm that could one day tear apart the empire he had so carefully built. The children, once his pride, now harbored a quiet resentment, not truly understanding the full picture, but deeply influenced by their mother's misleading counsel. Mr. Ohemeng, unaware of the growing tension, continued to focus on his businesses, oblivious to the fact that the real threat to his legacy was much closer to home than he realized. Mr. Ohemeng had always been a man of great ambition and vision. Long before he met either of his wives, he had already laid the foundation for his success. His businesses were thriving, and his reputation as a shrewd and honest businessman was well established. However, when he married Mrs. Chewa, she subtly began to weave a narrative that painted a different picture, one that twisted the truth to favor her own desires. In her version of events, she had played an essential role in building Mr. Ohemeng's empire. She often told their children that she had been by his side through thick and thin, helping him grow his businesses from the ground up. But when he became successful, she claimed, he betrayed her by marrying another woman, someone more educated, and unfairly favored her in every way. According to her, the second wife, Mrs. Abby Bresser, was handed a company on a silver platter simply because of her education, a privilege that she, the first wife, had been denied. Her words struck deep into the hearts of her children. They grew up believing that their father had wronged their mother, favoring his second wife for superficial reasons, Yet they never confronted him directly, never asked him about the truth of these accusations. Instead, they quietly nurtured a sense of resentment, convinced that their father valued his second wife more than their mother simply because she was more educated. The love and respect they should have had for their father were clouded by the seeds of doubt and mistrust their mother had sown. Then came the day that changed everything. Mr. Ohemeng, in the prime of his life, was as energetic and mentally sharp as ever. He had recently returned from a crucial business meeting abroad, a meeting that had the potential to expand his already thriving empire. After days of intense discussions with his partners, he came back to Ghana with a sense of accomplishment, ready to continue his work. But just a few days after his return, tragedy struck in the most unexpected way. On what seemed like an ordinary morning, Mr. Ohemeng was found unresponsive in his bathroom. The household was plunged into panic as they tried to revive him, but it was too late. The doctors who conducted the autopsy later confirmed that it was a tragic accident, a slip that had caused him to fall and hit his head. The news of his sudden death sent shockwaves through the business community, his family, and everyone who knew him. How could a man so full of life, health, and vitality be gone in an instant? It didn't seem possible. For his family, the news was not just shocking, it was devastating. His children, who had harbored doubts about their father, were now left with the painful realization that they would never have the chance to ask him the questions that had lingered in their hearts. They would never hear his side of the story, never know the truth about the sacrifices and decisions he had made. The man who had built so much for them was gone, leaving behind a legacy that was now overshadowed by the bitterness and confusion their mother had instilled in them. Two days after Mr. Ohemming's tragic death, his household, once a beacon of unity under his leadership, began to unravel. Mrs. Chewa was quick to gather her children, Abaye, Kumiwa, Jamfi, and Awuku. She spoke to them with a fervor fueled by years of festering resentment. This is our time, she said, her voice low but intense. Your father's legacy should belong to us. We are the first family. I am his first wife. 
We deserve everything he left behind. It's payback time. We must take control before everything falls into the hands of that woman and her children. This is our right. Her children, swayed by her passionate words, nodded in agreement. All except the youngest, Awuku. With a heavy heart, Awuku voiced his concern. Mother, I understand your pain, but this could tear the family apart. We should focus on maintaining peace and giving our father a proper burial. His words were met with sharp rebuke. You're too young to understand, Abeyi snapped. This is about what's rightfully ours. Keep quiet and let the adults handle it. Kumiwa added, Father favored them too much. It's time we stand up for ourselves. Despite Awuku's attempt to advocate for peace, his words were drowned out by the collective anger and determination of his siblings. Meanwhile, in a different part of the house, Mrs. Ababresa, the second wife, was having a very different conversation with her children, Nyako, Nomafo, and Bruwa. She too sensed the tension building between the two families. Now that your father is gone, she said gently, you must be very careful. Do not let anger drive your actions. Try to make peace with your half-siblings. This is a difficult time for all of us, and we must hold the family together. Her words were a stark contrast to the first wife's call to arms, but they were born out of the same grief and uncertainty. Mrs. Abby Brissy understood the fragile state of the family and knew that any wrong move could cause irreparable damage. She hoped her children would heed her advice and prioritize peace over conflict. However, the situation grew even more volatile when rumors began to spread, instigated by Mrs. Chewa. She whispered to anyone who would listen that Mrs. Abebresa had played a role in Mr. Oemeng's death, suggesting that she had somehow orchestrated the accident in the bathroom to seize control of the company. These baseless accusations quickly gained traction, causing shockwaves throughout the community. When Mrs. Abebresa heard the rumors, she was devastated. How could anyone believe that she would harm the man she loved? The rumors added fuel to the already burning fire, increasing the tension between the two families. What should have been a time of mourning was turning into a bitter battleground, with both sides digging in their heels. As tensions mounted, the elders of Mr. Ohameng's family decided to step in, they called a meeting with both wives to discuss the arrangements for the one-week celebration of his death, a tradition meant to honor the deceased and bring the family together. They proposed holding the event at Mr. Ohameng's personal residence, a neutral location where all his children and both wives could gather without any feelings of bias. Mrs. Abebreza, still reeling from the accusations against her, agreed to the plan. She understood the importance of unity, especially at such a critical time. But when the elders presented the idea to Mrs. Chaiwa, her response was anything but conciliatory. Standing before the elders, her voice trembling with a mix of anger and hurt, Mrs. Chaiwa declared, I have nothing to do with the murder of my husband. How dare you suggest I celebrate with the woman who took everything from me? I refuse to participate in this charade. There will be no one-week celebration with her. With those words, she stormed out of the meeting, leaving the elders in stunned silence. They exchanged worried glances, realizing the gravity of the situation. What was meant to be a time of mourning and reflection was quickly spiraling into a bitter family feud. Due to the deep misunderstandings and unresolved tensions between the two families, the one-week celebration of Mr. Ohameng's life, which was meant to bring the family together, was delayed by more than two months. The discord had grown so intense that neither side could agree on a single, unified event. 
This delay only served to deepen the divide between the two families. Mrs. Chewa, the first wife, was well aware that her late husband's prominence and connections would likely draw significant financial support during the one-week celebration. She decided to organize her own separate event at her home, confident that this would secure her and her children a substantial share of the legacy. In her mind, this was the best way to ensure that her family received the recognition and resources she believed they deserved. On the other hand, Mrs. Abebressa, the second wife, found herself with no choice but to plan a separate celebration as well. Despite her reluctance to divide the family further, she knew that she had to honor her husband in the best way possible. She hoped that those who knew and respected Mr. Ohemeng, especially through the company she managed, would attend her event and offer their support. As the day approached, both wives prepared for their respective celebrations, each hoping to attract the prominent figures who had been part of Mr. Ohemeng's life. However, when the day finally arrived, the outcome was unexpected. Unfortunately for Mrs. Chewa, many of the prominent people she had anticipated seeing at her event chose instead to attend the celebration organized by Mrs. Abi Bresse. These individuals were more familiar with Mrs. Abi Bresse due to her active role in managing one of Mr. Ohemeng's companies. Her involvement in the business world had earned her respect and recognition among her husband's associates, which played a crucial role in their decision to support her during this difficult time. At the one-week celebration held at Mrs. Abebresse's residence, the turnout was impressive. Many influential business associates, family friends, and prominent figures came in large numbers, bringing with them significant contributions to honor the memory of Mr. Ohemeng. The event was not only a tribute to the late businessman, but also a reflection of the respect and admiration that many had for the woman who had stood by his side in managing his business affairs. The financial support she received was substantial, far exceeding her expectations, and it helped cover the costs of the event while also providing additional security for her and her children. In contrast, the celebration at Mrs. Chaiwa's home was a more modest affair. Despite her best efforts, the turnout was much lower than she had hoped. The prominent individuals she had expected did not attend, and the financial contributions were significantly less than what she had anticipated. The event, rather than being a moment of triumph and recognition for her family, became a stark reminder of the divisions that had been sown over the years. This outcome was a bitter disappointment for Mrs. Chewa. The disparity between the two celebrations only deepened her resentment and frustration. She couldn't help but feel that she and her children had been marginalized in favor of the second wife and her family a sentiment that further fueled the existing animosity. The stark contrast in the support each wife received during the one-week celebration underscored the growing divide between the two branches of Mr. Ohemeng's family. What should have been a time of mourning and reflection had instead become a display of the fragmented nature of the family. The financial disparity, the unequal turnout, and the differing levels of support all highlighted the fractures that had formed in the wake of Mr. Ohe Meng's death. As the dust settled after the one-week celebrations, the future of the family remained uncertain. The events of the past months had not only fractured relationships, but had also set the stage for further conflicts over Mr. Ohemeng's estate and the control of his businesses. What should have been a period of collective grief and remembrance had instead become a battleground, with both sides vying for control and recognition. When Mrs. Chewa realized the humiliating disparity between her one-week celebration 
and that of the second wife, Mrs. Abibressa, she was filled with anger and frustration. She gathered her children, Abaye, Kumiwa, Jamfi, and Awuku, around her and spoke with bitterness in her voice. This disgrace we've faced is because the second wife has already sabotaged us to your father's friends and family, she claimed. That's why so few people came to support us. She's turned them all against us. The family continued to grapple with the unresolved tensions, and when a date was finally set for Mr. Ohameng's funeral, another storm began brewing. The issue of inheritance and the division of Mr. Ohameng's substantial properties led to chaos within the family when it was discovered that he had not made a will. This revelation set the stage for a bitter struggle over his assets. Fueled by her desire to secure her children's future, Mrs. Abibressa incited her children to take legal action. She urged them to go to court and file for an injunction to delay the funeral until the matter of inheritance was resolved. She argued that it would be unjust to proceed with the burial, while the question of who would inherit the late businessman's estate remained unsettled. At the same time, Mrs. Chewa insisted that Mrs. Abibresi and her children had no right to continue managing the company. She argued that as the first wife, she and her children should be the rightful owners of the business. However, Mrs. Abibresi firmly denied these claims, maintaining her position as the acting director of the company. With no resolution in sight, the two wives and their respective children took their battle to court, where they sought a legal solution to the conflict. The eldest son from the first marriage, Abaye, was particularly determined to see the second wife and her children ousted from the company. He vowed to fight with every ounce of strength he had to ensure that they earned nothing from his father's death. To him, this was not just a battle over money and property, it was a fight to preserve his mother's dignity and secure what he believed was rightfully theirs. As the legal battle dragged on, both families came to see each other as enemies, spending countless hours in court rather than focusing on the management of the company. This neglect began to take its toll on the business. Despite being the acting director, Mrs. Abibresse was increasingly distracted by the court proceedings, while Abaye, who served as the company's accountant, was also preoccupied with the litigation. Both families began to drain the company's resources to fund their legal battles, further straining the business that had once been a thriving enterprise under Mr. Ohameng's leadership. Months passed with no resolution in sight. The body of Mr. Ohameng remained in the mortuary, a grim symbol of the family's ongoing conflict. As the case continued, it appeared that the second wife was gaining the upper hand in court, much to the dismay of Abay and his mother. Despite the mounting evidence that they were losing the case, they refused to back down, determined to fight to the bitter end. Frustrated by the lack of progress and the growing disgrace of having Mr. Ohameng's body lie unburied for so long, his extended family decided to intervene. They saw that the ongoing feud was not only damaging the family's reputation, but also preventing them from honoring their loved one with a proper burial. After nearly ten months of fruitless legal wrangling, they took the unprecedented step of suing both the first and second wives, demanding that the court allow them to proceed with the burial while the inheritance dispute continued. The court was left to deliberate on this unusual request. The judge, aware of the family's deep divisions and the importance of maintaining cultural and familial respect, understood the gravity of the situation. The prolonged conflict had not only tarnished the family's standing in the community, but had also prevented them from fulfilling a fundamental duty, laying their patriarch to rest. As the court battles dragged on, it became increasingly clear to Mrs. Chewa 
that she and her children were losing ground. The second wife, Mrs. Abebresa, appeared to be winning the legal fight, and the prospects of securing the inheritance she had long coveted were slipping away. Desperate and consumed by bitterness, Mrs. Chewa turned to a dark and sinister solution. She sought out a spiritualist, hoping that supernatural intervention might succeed where legal means had failed. The spiritualist, known for his dubious practices, listened to Mrs. Chewa's grievances and devised a plan to eliminate her rival once and for all. He gave her a charm, a magical powder, along with instructions to sprinkle it on Mrs. Abibres's office seat. The powder, he assured her, would weaken and eventually kill the second wife, paving the way for Mrs. Chewa and her children to claim the company and the wealth they believed was rightfully theirs. With a mixture of fear and determination, Mrs. Chewa brought the charm to her son, Abaye, who worked in the same company as Mrs. Abebrasi. She confided in him the sinister plan, and together they conspired to carry it out. Late one night, when the office was empty, Abaye slipped into Mrs. Abebrasi's office and sprinkled the magic powder on her chair, just as the spiritualist had instructed. The next morning, unaware of the treachery that had taken place, Mrs. Abibresse arrived at work. She sat at her desk, ready to face another day of managing the company and fighting for her late husband's legacy. But from that moment, her health began to deteriorate. The charm worked its evil magic, and within days, she became seriously unwell. Her once robust health faltered, and she was soon spending more time in the hospital than in the office. As Mrs. Abebrise's condition worsened, Abaye and his mother saw an opportunity. With the second wife incapacitated and no longer able to oversee the company, they began to steal from the business. They took company cars, siphoned off funds, and sold off valuable properties. Their greed knew no bounds as they sought to strip the company of its assets, convinced that they could take what they wanted without consequence, but their actions were not without consequences. Two months later, Mrs. Abebrese died, succumbing to the effects of the dark magic that had been used against her. Her death marked a tragic and unjust end to a life that had been devoted to her family and the business she had helped build. But even as Mrs. Chewa and Abaye reveled in their newfound wealth, they failed to recognize the deeper truth of what they had done. The Bible warns us in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 to 10, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. This passage speaks directly to the situation at hand. Mrs. Chewa and Abayi, in their insatiable desire for wealth and power, fell into the very snare that the Apostle Paul warned about. Their craving for material gain led them down a path of moral decay, where they were willing to commit heinous acts to achieve their goals. They allowed their greed to blind them to the true values of life, love, family, integrity, and instead they pursued wealth at any cost. In their pursuit of riches, they lost sight of the simple truth that all the wealth in the world is meaningless if it costs you your soul. The love of money drove them to commit acts of evil, and in the end, they pierced themselves with many pangs. The wealth they gained was tainted with the blood of an innocent woman, and no amount of money could erase the guilt and the consequences that would inevitably follow. The aftermath of Mrs. 
Abbe Bresse's death left a heavy burden on both families. The company, once thriving under Mr. Ohomeng's leadership, was now in shambles, torn apart by greed and conflict. The legal battles continued, but now with a darker shadow hanging over them. The community, once respectful of the Ohomeng family, began to view them with suspicion and disdain, sensing the undercurrents of betrayal and corruption that had seeped into every aspect of their lives. The sudden and mysterious death of Mrs. Abebrese left her family in deep sorrow and suspicion. Unable to accept the idea that her passing was natural, they sought answers beyond the physical realm. They visited a soothsayer, hoping to uncover the truth about what had really happened. The soothsayer performed a ritual to call upon the spirit of Mrs. Abebrese, and what they witnessed was both heartbreaking and alarming. Her ghost appeared before them, tears streaming down her face as she spoke. It was not my time, she cried. I died fighting for my children. The person behind my death is none other than Chewa. The revelation shook the family to its core. They realized that Mrs. Abebrese's death had been the result of a dark and sinister act, a spiritual killing that could not be addressed through the courts. The battle, they understood, would have to be fought on a spiritual plane. However, Nyako, Mrs. Abebrese's first son, was not willing to let his mother's death go unpunished. He was filled with a burning desire for revenge, determined to avenge her untimely passing. But rather than abandoning the legal fight, Nyarko chose to follow in his mother's footsteps, continuing to pursue justice in court while secretly plotting his revenge. The tension between the two families reached new heights when Nyako and Abai, Mrs. Chewa's eldest son, appeared in court together to contest the distribution of Mr. Ohameng's properties and finalize the arrangements for his burial. After the case was adjourned, the two men exchanged words that sent chills down the spines of everyone who witnessed it. Abai leaned in close to Nyako and whispered with a sinister smirk, you're biting off more than you can chew. It seems you've forgotten what killed your mother. Nyarko, his voice steady and resolute, replied, I'm fully aware of what and who killed her. The brief exchange was laden with tension, and those around them couldn't help but see it as a direct threat. It was clear that the animosity between the two families was far from over. The court battles might have been continuing, but it was evident that the conflict had moved beyond mere legal disputes. A dark and dangerous game was being played, with both sides willing to go to great lengths to secure what they believed was rightfully theirs. In the next episode, we will dive into what will happen to these two families and the legacy of their father. The battle is far from over. Share with us if you know of similar stories like this. Comment with yes if you do. Let us know where you're watching this story from, and don't forget to subscribe to Anansi Web of Tales if you love our stories. Thank you so much for watching, and remember this. Ecclesiastes 5.10.13 reminds us, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them, and what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. This passage is a powerful reminder that the pursuit of wealth for its own sake is ultimately empty and can lead to one's downfall. The love of money and the greed that often accompanies it are destructive forces, capable of tearing apart families, ruining lives, and leaving a legacy of pain and regret. Amen. See you in the next episode.